Bibles open, remain standing if you would. You can remain standing as we read from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, good looking group again tonight. Thanks for coming out. And uh, it's been a good meeting so far. And I'm glad to have some of our teenagers here with us tonight. Brother Joe Dawson's our youth pastor and kiddos from Crossroads. Don't you wave at us back there. All right, good. We're glad that y'all are here. Glad you made it through all the traffic. Sometimes you never know. Sometimes it can take you an hour and 20 minutes to get to Mesquite from Gainesville. Sometimes it can take you four hours. <laughs> it just depends. Good to see you, Brother Anderson. And uh, glad to see you tonight. And uh, well, what a, what a good meeting this has been so far. And I agree with what Pastor Wells said just a moment ago, it, it only takes that one message. You know, and truthfully, the night that I got right with God, I don't even remember who was preaching. I don't even remember what the sermon was or anything, but I know that the Holy Spirit was just walking all over me. And by the time the invitation was given, I came down to the altar. I was so broken. I mean, I was broken hearted. And boy, we, we just don't see that enough in our services. We don't see that brokenness much more uh, in many of our church services. But God broke my heart. And uh, before I realized that there was two friends that was kneeling down beside me, uh, both of those men are pastors now. One is Pastor John Booth and, uh, from Clinton, Iowa, and another friend of mine, Josh Lovins, who pastors in Indiana. But we were just teenagers at this time. And boy, we got together and we prayed and we wept together and we prayed and asked God to do something with us. And we didn't even realize it, but everybody had gone back to their seat and the whole service, everybody's waiting to go home. They're just waiting on three teenage boys that were down there getting thoroughly right with God. But that was a turning point for me. Last night I mentioned it in the, the prayer for the message. And I believe that every young person at some point in their life needs to have that moment, that burning bush moment. That Isaiah 6 uh, moment where all of a sudden God becomes real to you. Because it's one thing to be godly, uh, good, uh, good, it's another thing to be godly. And boy, I just, I hope that God just lights somebody on fire this week. I just want to see God light somebody on fire. Look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12. These are familiar verses to us, and many of you have probably committed the first two verses to memory. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But I want you to notice, as we continue reading in verse number three is our text tonight, the Bible says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He says, Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You know, we live in the high self-esteem movement generation. And everything is about, don't hurt my feelings, build me up, give me positive vibes, give me positive feedback. And that's the generation we live in. But I want to turn that completely upside down tonight. And I want to preach on this thought, lowering your self-esteem. Lowering your self -esteem. Esteem. Father, help us as we preach. Lord, give me the words to preach, and I pray that it would be a blessing to each and every listener tonight. We need your power. We can't do it on your own. And Holy Spirit, you can preach a message that I can't preach. And Lord, folks, they don't need to hear from Randy Taylor tonight. They need to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that some young person tonight would hear the voice of God in their heart speaking to them. Bless the message. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. From the time we're very young, we start building a kingdom to ourselves, and whether we like it or not, we're all kingdom builders. And uh, we, we're, we're building a kingdom to us and to what we want and to what we like. And, 
And this is the Me First Generation. Several years ago, Time Magazine put on the front cover of their magazine. Every year they choose somebody to be person of the year. And this particular year, they said, we've become such a self-absorbed society. They said that you are person of the year. Me. Because that's what it's really all about. It's really all about me. And it starts little, you know. Uh, from birth, even as an infant, they want their life, everybody else's life, to revolve around them, right? They, they, they want picked up. When they're ready to be picked up, they want you to roll them over. They want you to change them. They want you to burp them. I mean, they, they, they know how to get mom and daddies to listen. Brother Joe, they get a new baby that was just born, and Texas-sized baby, amen. And, uh, but those babies are amazing because they, they know, even at that little age, how to make those little noises in the night, how to make those squeaks and those pampers and those cries just to, you know, Wake mama up. Now, don't wake daddy up, but it wakes mama up. My wife, she tells me, she said, man, last night, I, man, the baby just seemed like she cried all night long. I said, she did. I don't remember that. And uh, I try to help, but my soul, that, that's, that crying makes me sleepy. I just sleep right through it. And uh, I try to do my part. I do diapers. No, really, I say, honey, you need to do that diaper. I mean, come on. Whoo, I can only take so much. But from, from a baby... We want everything to surround us, and, and we want it all to be our way. But it doesn't end there, does it? You've heard about the terrible twos. How many of you got a brother or sister that's in the terrible twos? Uh, we've got a terrible three right now, all right? And, uh, but kids do the funniest stuff. I mean, we had, me and my wife were sitting at a dinner table and, and uh, sitting there eating some uh, sandwiches and some Doritos and my wife, she grabs one of those Doritos out of the chip bag, and she goes to take a bite of it, and she goes, oh, man, this does, this, there's something wrong with these chips. She pulled another one out, and, man, there's something wrong with them. They're, like, defective. We need to take them back to the store. They don't have any flavor. And about that time, our daughter comes walking in, and she's got cheese all over her fingers, all over her face. She had been taking all the chips out of the bag, licking all the nacho cheese off of them and putting them back in the bag, you know, so... Hey, when you got six kids, nothing's safe, man. You know, if you set a drink down, you got you to gotta really watch before you pick that thing up and drink out of it again. doesn't matter if you just set it down 20 seconds ago. You better check that thing for floaties. You never know who has been using that cup. But you hear about the terrible twos. What's that all about? Well, that's just about that little kid saying, hey, I want it my way faster, more immediate, right now, right now, right now. I can't wait. Give it to me my way right now. And then they go into the primaries. And then their kingdoms begin to change. They want different things. Now the toys get more expensive. Now they want candy. Now they want excitement. Now they want fun. Now they want cartoons, right? I love it when kids are like two and three because, I mean, you can just give them a wrapper and they'll play with it. You know, it's Christmas. Everybody else open up Christmas presents and you got your, your, your one or your two-year-old and they got a, you know, a piece of wrapping paper going, <laughs> And they're like, hey, we just should have just got our refrigerator box for Christmas, you know. But as they get older, they get more expensive. I was at a Toys R Us Christmas shopping, and I saw a grandmother, and she was talking to one of the, the guys in the electronic department about what would be the best laptop to buy for her four-year-old. I thought, what in the world is a four-year-old going to do with a laptop other than dump Dr. Pepper all over the keyboard, I can just imagine what my kids would have done at four years old. Well, I remember what one of my daughters did to a brand new laptop when she was little. Brand new laptop. She's here so I can embarrass her. Brand spanking new laptop. And it's sitting there on my office desk. And I hear something up, up there, you know, making noise. I can tell somebody's messing with my keyboard. I go up there, and she's got her fingers dug into the keyboard, pulling off keys. <laughs> and she's got all the keys from my keyboard picked off, and it's just a bear. So that's what four-year-olds do to laptops. And so, man, everything just gets more expensive. But then they become a teenager. And once again, their kingdoms begin to change. And now their kingdom begins to center around their identity and their image. You know, they got to get the right hairdo. 
you know, now they're starting to worry. You know, and they didn't worry when they were 11, you know, what they looked like. And they didn't care, man, what, you know, their mom still dressed them. They didn't care if they come to church with pants like this. You know, they don't care. But you get to be a teenager and you start, you know, you go through that awkward stage and you really just don't know what to do with yourself yet. This body, you know, you, you, you got a head that's bigger than your proportionately to your body, you know, and everything just feels awkward and you can't really seem to fit in anywhere and so you try to be cool, but you're just not cool. And the more you try to be cool and the more you try to say funny things, you pretty much just perfect the art of nerdiness to all of your friends. It's just, we all go through that stage. And so, you know, you come into the youth center on Sunday morning, you want to look cool and so you, you know, you do the lean. So, you know, or you do the slouch, <sighs> you know, and so you just, you just, it's just awkward, right? And so it all becomes about identity. And so, man, people will paint their bodies up with graffiti and call it tattoos and they'll spend hours trying to fix their hairs in ways that it, so that it won't look fixed. You know why they do that? It's because it's an obsession with self and life becomes to the place where it just revolves around us, around me. What do I look like? What do people think about me? What are my friends saying about me? What are they saying about me on Facebook? What are they saying about me at school? And man, every time they walk by a mirror, they just can't pass it up, you know? It's funny. Have you ever seen an elevator that has mirrors in it? And uh, nobody can resist that. They walk into that elevator and the first thing they do is, You know, you see one, you see one in the hallway, you know, and you're walking by and, hey, <laughs> you know, and people get obsessed with themselves and what they look like. You want to see a teenage girl get severely depressed? Just let her wake up with a zit the size of Zambia on her forehead. And she'll lay in bed with the head over her, her, the covers over her head saying, I'm not going to go to school. I'm not going to go to school. Right? I mean, it's just depressing. Because it's all, you know, it's just about image. And in, and in order to have a proper kingdom, your shoes must cost $200. In order to have a proper kingdom... You can't have an Xbox 360. You have to have an Xbox One. You got to have a PS4. You got to have whatever. And I don't even know if those are the latest and greatest anymore, but whatever. You know, I mean, you got to have the latest phone, everything in order to have a proper kingdom. Otherwise, your parents are mistreating you because they have not given you it. But here's the thing. You will never be satisfied with things. Never. You'll never be satisfied with things. And so, man, we demand the brand name clothes and shoes and vanity, vanity. All is vanity. And it just becomes an obsession with self. But then those selfish teenagers become adults. It's not bad to be an adult, okay? You'll get there someday. Ooh, adults. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. But this is what happens. You got a guy over here, Mr. Pimples, right? And he looks across over here and he sees some knockout and his heart just goes, <laughs> the love boat is about to set sail, ooh, ooh, right? And so you've got this guy marries this girl, but this guy for 20 years has done nothing but build a kingdom to himself. And this girl for 20 years has done nothing but build a kingdom to herself. And you put two kingdom builders in the same house, and right away, the battle has begun on whose kingdom is most important. And nobody can get along. And nobody wants to give up their rights, their freedoms, whose career is most important, whose life's most important, whose family's most important. That's what I'm talking about. Every day we seek to build these stronger kingdoms. And that's why, listen, young person, that's why God gives you these people called parents and teachers 
and youth pastors and pastors because it is their job to be kingdom controllers. And it's their job to get you over yourself. That's why they make you get out of bed when you don't want to get out of bed. That's why they make you do chores. That's why, that's why Brother Jonathan Wells makes you play games that are embarrassing. I don't want to play a game like that. It's embarrassing. You know what he's doing? He's helping you get over yourself. That's why we like to take you to camp and let you wa wallow in the mud. Because it's embarrassing. That's why youth pastors make people get up and do crazy times where they got to eat chocolate pudding out of a baby diaper. I'm not doing that in front of my friends. That's embarrassing. But you got to get over yourself. You know why we can't have revival? What will people think of me if I go forward? What will they think if I get saved? You know, there's people that will die and go to hell just because they were scared that they would embarrass themselves in front of a friend. Now, you know what? I've got a lot of good friends, and I've got family that love me dearly, but I'm not willing to go to hell for any friend. But if all you do is look at yourself and what you want and what you think life is supposed to be, you'll never do anything for God. So that's the struggle that we deal with. Look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 again in verse number 3. For I say unto you through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And we need to ask God to help us get our mind off of self. What does Socrates say? Know yourself. What does the, the psychiatrist say? Express yourself. What's the counselor say? Love yourself. What's the hedonist say? Enjoy yourself. What's the world say? Indulge yourself. What does the leisure industry say? Pamper yourself. And then what does Jesus say? Deny yourself. Ooh. That sounds terrible. Deny yourself. I've never denied myself anything. I, I don't even deny myself sleep to read my Bible. I don't even deny myself any privilege, any comfort. It all revolves around me. I can't even deny myself to help my parents. I can't even deny myself to do my chores. And you listen to the words of Christ, and boy, that sounds ugly, doesn't it? Deny yourself. I'm talking about getting over self. Jesus says, if you cannot humble yourself, you're of no use to God. None. Now listen, there is no person in this room that's too small for God to use. There's never been a person too small for God to use. But you can get too big for God to use. What does Jesus say? Matthew 23, 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be what? Abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be what? Exalted. So that tells us something. That the way down with God is up. But the way up with God is down. I like what the preacher did tonight, having us come forward to an altar. You know, if he didn't ask every single person to come to the altar, I wonder how long it's been before you've ever knelt at an altar. Amen. You see, I don't understand why we have to go to an altar because we're humbling ourselves. God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And we come and we say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for the way that I've lived. We humble ourselves. Now, you think about a good illustration of this principle. The best illustration in all the Bible is Lucifer. Lucifer exalted himself higher than any person has ever exalted themselves. 
He said, I will be like the Most High God. I will ascend to the stars of God. I'm going to sit on the throne of God. I mean, he set himself up equal with God. And God said, for that, I'm going to humble you more than any man. Has. I'm going to bring you lower than any person has ever been brought. As a matter of fact, I'm going to humble you to the point where even the earth itself is not low enough. I'm going to create a place for you in the earth, and I'm going to bring you that low. That's what the Lord did to Lucifer. But then you look at the life of Christ. And there has never been a person that's ever walked on this earth who has ever humbled themselves the way Jesus humbled himself. In Philippians 2, the Bible said, even though he thought it not robber to be equal with God, he was God. He made himself of no reputation. How many people are spending their whole life working on their reputation? Working on their image? made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. So what did he do? He humbled himself further than any person has ever been humbled. And God the Father in return says because he has humbled himself more than any other humbled, at all the way to the cross he humbled himself. What does the Bible say? That God hath given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm telling you, there is something to this principle of humbling yourself. And so listen, the devil is after your mind. Your mind is the battleground. And whatever has your mind has you. And we live in a day and age where people live with, with problems that they have made up in their own minds. They live with this victim mentality, and we want to magnify our problems, and we want to make mountains out of molehills. And what, hey, one of these days you're going to wake up and discover that there are people out there that have real problems. I know of a young lady who has had six abortions before she was 16 by her father. Listen, I tell you, there are people out there that have dealt with some real problems. But not getting a new pair of Nikes, that's not one of them. Your mom forgetting to pick up your favorite hairspray when she went to Target is not one of them. All right, we got to get over ourselves. We got to get over our image. Because this is what the world wants to do. The world wants to get your mind totally on you. Would you help me out here, buddy? Would you just come sit up here for just a minute? Tell me your name. Markel, just sit right here, buddy. You know what the world wants to do? The world wants to do this right here. Wants to get a mirror. Let's get a little bit closer. Now tell me what you see. Say that again. What do you see? Me. Now what do you see? Me. <laughs> you go to the counselor, you go to the psychiatrist, you go to Facebook. And you know what all the advice you're going to get is? Just look deeper in yourself. Reach deep down in there and pull out that good hero, that that amazing person that's inside of there and let it free. You know what the Bible says is in this heart of mine? Paul said, I know what dwelleth in me, dwelleth no good thing, nothing, nothing. And the world will keep this in front of you all the time. Now, you know, you know what we have done? You know what we've done with social media? Social media has replaced people's relationship with God. You know, it used to be that only God was omnipresent. And only God was all-knowing. And only God knew the innermost thoughts and feelings of a person's heart. But what do people do now? They go to Facebook and 
They'll put a little frowny face on there and they'll say, I'm feeling sad today. I'm feeling a bit melancholy. And they wait till all their little friends come around and say, Oh, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why you feel so bad? Why are you so frowny faced? You know, there was a day when, when, when that's what we went to God about. When we went and told God, you know, I'm having a bad day. I'm feeling depressed. There's something wrong with my spirit. There's something wrong with my attitude. But we've replaced it with a mirror. We've replaced it with, with us. And we just stare at that mirror. You see how self-absorbed our human nature is? You know what a narcissist is? Somebody, all they can do is talk about themselves. I mean, every conversation, they're, they're the hero of every story. It's all about me, 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 me. And we have been indoctrinated by this, this high self-esteem movement. Now listen to what this verse says. Philippians 2 and verse 3, you can look at it if you want, mark it in your Bible. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Listen, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now let me ask you this question. Let's talk about self-esteem for just a minute. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would like to have a neighbor with high self-esteem and high self-worth and a high opinion of himself? Or would you rather have a neighbor who was humble and modest? Which one do you think would be a better neighbor? How about this? How many of you would like to be employed by someone with a high self-esteem and a high sense of self-worth? Or would you rather be employed by someone who's humble and modest? How many of you, how many of you would like to employ someone with high self-esteem and high self-worth? And they're too good to make french fries. And they're too good to clean the bathroom. And they're too good to come to church and clean out the baptistry. How many of you would like to employ somebody with a high self-worth? Or would you rather employ somebody who's humble and modest? You see where we're at as a generation? People won't even work at McDonald's unless they're guaranteed a minimum wage of 20 bucks. You know why? Because I'm worth it. No, you're not. You're a stinking lazy couch potato that's never done a thing in your life. You drop out of high school when you're 14, and then you want to make something that people in the real world that have worked for an education and work. You, are you serious? But this is where we're at as a generation. It's all about me, 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 me. So this is what employers have found out about those with high self-esteem. They found out that people with high self-esteem just want to tell everybody else what to do. How many of you would like to be married to somebody with high self-esteem and a high sense of worth? Or would you rather be married to somebody that's humble and modest? Jesus says the opposite. He said, you exalt yourself, you get abased. You humble yourself, you get exalted. Now listen to this research. Studies show the higher the self-esteem, the lower the self-control. Isn't that interesting? The higher opinion of oneself, the lower the respect for other people. They found people with high self-esteem have lower achievements on average. But we have been so duped by the power of positive thinking. And we have taught this generation that they've got to reach deep down and pick. Hey, 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 that is a lie. And I know it's been teaching, being taught in our schools. And I know it's taught in every cartoon that, we, that our children watch. And, and hey, you say, well, Brother Randy, you know, what about somebody like me that has very low self-esteem? <sighs> everybody picks on me. And everybody thinks I'm ugly. And everybody don't like my hair. Can I say that even that is still pride? You know why? Because it's still all about you.
that the answer to that question is no? Because, let's, let, let me use this as an illustration, all right? Everybody with me tonight? You remember the story when the Lord sent 12 men to spy out Canaan? How many you know this song? Ten were, two were, yeah, right? So, ten of those men come back and they say, oh man, there's giants in the land. I mean, we look like grasshoppers. It's very interesting how the Bible words that because it says we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so were we in their sight. It's very interesting because when you feel like a grasshopper, you look like a grasshopper to the world. So they come out with this terrible report that, oh man, this is it. I know we've won all these battles up to this point, but this one, no, we're going up against the giants and the giants are too good. Of course, all those cowboy fans know that's not true. <laughs> okay, maybe it is. Next year will be the year. 80-year-old Tony Romo gets out there. But you had two men. You had two men. What did they say? We got this. We got this. The battle is ours. What's the difference? It wasn't in self-confidence. The difference is those two guys had God confidence. Now, how would, you, how would this verse sound if I just said it like this? I can do all things. You'd say, really? <laughs> you can walk on water. You can see through walls. You can fly. You can jam. I know I definitely can't do that. <laughs> I got a half inch vertical. <clears throat> but if you finish the verse, I can do all things through Christ. That's God confidence. So here's the thing. God tells us that he wants us to have meekness. And meekness is strength. You know what meekness is? Meekness is knowing, having the confidence that you can do something and do it well, but having the self-control to hold back. And the self-esteem movement, it has led to an alarming rise in teen depression and in teen suicide. And they found out that people with very high self-esteem don't do very well with disappointment. High self-esteem ideals have been a hindrance to the, young, the, the teenagers of this generation because when you place a mirror in front of somebody and make them feel sorry for themselves, you are creating a mental, an emotional, and an often a spiritual cripple. People with high self-esteem usually have low respect and consideration for others. I saw a woman one time in a grocery store and the man in the deli had cut up her lunch meat incorrectly and handed her something that she didn't ask for. And here's a full-grown woman begins to throw a two-year-old diaper baby fit Right, how many of you have ever seen somebody do this in a store? I mean, it's just you look at that and you think, Really, look at yourself. I want to get my phone out and record it. <laughs> look at you. You know why? That's what that's what the world promotes. How dare you mess up my day? How dare you cut in front of me in traffic? Don't you know who I am? I am the great me. And woe be unto the... This is the thing. Everybody wants to be treated like first place, don't they? Everybody. Everybody wants to be number one. But isn't it amazing how we act when we're treated like number two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty 10, 20, 30 on the list? Yeah. I remember a man named Haman... And a man named Mordecai. Here's a man, Haman. As he rides into the city, 
everybody's bowing down to Haman except for one Jew that had his number. One man wouldn't bow. Everybody else is bowing but one guy, and he said, I'm going to exterminate all the Jews because that one guy. That's what pride does. And if there's anybody in the youth department that doesn't agree with you, and if there's anybody in the youth department that doesn't see it your way, you're going to ostracize them. You're going to treat them like a snob. You're not going to talk to them because they have offended the great you. All hail the great you. Everybody all right tonight? We got to get our mind off of self, off of me. So this is the problem. When you look in that mirror, what do you see? Me. And I can't go soul winning because of me. And I came to church, but nobody wanted to sit with me. Nobody's friends with me. You know what we need? We need to get a divorce from me and start Start thinking about, listen, about others. And by the way, if you say, I don't have any friends, you've told on yourself. The Bible said a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So this is what you got to do. What God's trying to get you to do and what this revival hopefully will cause you to do is to take this and destroy it. And replace it with a window. Now what do you see? Them. And he's good. (laughs) Look not every man on his what? Own things, but every man also on the things of others. We need to have a revival of serving others. The Bible says this. Let me read it again. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I'm talking about a revival of loving others, of praising others, a revival of rejoicing when somebody else gets exalted, rejoicing when somebody else gets to sing the special, rejoice when somebody gets to be the preacher boy that's chosen to preach. Listen to this verse, Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Can you you imagine if every teenager in our church lived by this verse? We wouldn't even be able to get out of the door tonight. No, go, go, no, you go first. No, 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 after you. No, seriously, no, after you. No, I couldn't possibly. No, it'd be like like watching the Three Stooges. No, after you. No, after you. We wouldn't even be able to eat pizza tomorrow night. No, you go in line. No, no, no. No, really, I prefer you over me. I mean, can you imagine? I could not imagine if my kids lived by this verse. Man, when we say it's dinner time, it's like, ah! I'm like, in honor, preferring one another. What? 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 We need to find new life and go from taking to giving. That's really what maturity is all about. Now listen, 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 listen. Here's one of the things you'll, that you'll, one of these things that you'll have to come to grips with in life. The older you get, really the less it is about you. Because when you're a little kid, you know, people have to look out for you. My small children, if my wife doesn't cook for them, They wouldn't know what to do. If my wife didn't wash their clothes, they wouldn't care. My son Evan, he would wear the same thing every day. He tries to do that anyway. By the time we finally get those blue jeans off of them, we just stand them up in the corner. They stand there by themselves. They're so dirty. But the whole time you're growing up, you've got people that are serving you, serving you, serving But then you reach a point in life where all of that changes. 
And you have to start serving other people. Now, when me and my wife got married, we had to start, I had to start, and she had to start learning how to look out for the needs of one another. Then we had children. And let me tell you something. It is impossible to be selfish and be a parent at the same time. It's just, you just can't. There's too many people that depend on you, too many people that need you. I've been staying at my grandparents' house the last uh, day, and, and what I was just thinking about today, you know, their whole life they have served me. I have done so little for them. I'm 33 years of age. I have done so little for them in comparison for how many times they have fed me, how many times they have bought things for me, how many times they have put money in my hands. And I think, you know what? They're at the age now. I don't know how long they'll live. I'll never be able to catch up to them with how much they've invested into me. But they've spent their whole life serving. And the sooner you learn this young person, the sooner God can begin to use you. Because everything about ministry is not just about getting up in here and preaching. And it's not about you just getting up and singing a special. Ministry is serving. It's ministering. It's being a servant. So let's ask the Lord to get our minds and our thoughts off of us and our drama And say, hey, you know what? Mom just showed up. I'm going to go out there and help her get the groceries out of the car. Man, what in the world's preacher doing with that vacuum vacuum in the church hallway? I'm not going to let my preacher do that. Man, you guys go run, meet that need. And say, Lord, help me get my mind on others. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Thanks for your help, buddy. You can set that over there by that mirror if you'd like to.